This is the Fatty Joe Show, coming to you from Casa de Carrie, deep in the forests of Nutmegerville. This show is dedicated to exploring pathways to better health from a holistic perspective. In each episode, we will explore such topics as nutrition, mental and emotional health, fitness, and more. I'm Yogi, your host, and I became interested in studying health after conventional health dogma became damaging and led me to become massively overweight. Against modern convention, I went on a keto lifestyle and I lost over 300 pounds and gained a level of control on my personal health that I never had before. Now I'm on a journey to find out what is myth and what is truth in the ever convoluted world of what is considered healthy. Come join me on a journey of discovery as I look for a path to improve total health. If you'd like to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash the fatty Joe show or patreon.com slash Carrie Brown. If you want to check out all of our social media links and recipes, head to carriebrown.com. Don't forget to leave a comment, like, and subscribe to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the first episode of the Fatty Joe Show. Today, our very first guest is somebody that actually represents how I started in my nutritional journey and my health journey. I have on today Michael Rutherford, who is from Destination Health, a radio show that I would listen to um, that taught me about keto. He is a functional nutritional therapy practitioner, a primal health coach, and he's also a classically trained chef, so he can also give us a lot of tips on uh, great food. He practices primarily working with truckers and helping them get healthy. And for those of you who don't know, because we're new to the podcast, I was a trucker for seven years. At one point, I topped out over 600 pounds. And now, and because of my healthy journey and where I started with Destination Health, I am now, as of the way in today, 305 and uh, heading down to being under 300 pounds for the first time since I've been in my 20s. So I got started because I heard all these great educated people from Destination Health that turned me on to a lot of other great educated people, and Michael is, is one of them, and we're going to go ahead and have a conversation with him right now. Hi, Michael. How are you doing today? I am doing great. That's just, that's an incredible, I mean, you were literally happy the person and yet also probably twice the person you were i think it's just <laughs> incredible the what the change can do like that yeah it i had been an athlete a uh, majority of my life i worked out hard but i always struggled with my weight i was in the gym all the time lifting weights before trucking i actually did pro wrestling for a while i was a surfer and after a car accident, it left me fairly immobile. So that weight struggles that I had before when I was an athlete just skyrocketed. And I, I was constantly up and down. And I heard actually your dad talking about keto. And it, I thought it was malarkey. But one of the things that he, he talked about was CTE, which is the traumatic brain injury. And that's, it comes from repeated, even one concussion can eventually cause CTE and it can vary in individual people. But I had, I started having symptoms very similar to CTE. I had depression, uncontrolled emotion, almost like, man, not quite manic, but almost kind of like that where I was constantly up and down. Um, a lot, I, I literally felt like my brain was underwater half the time and remembering short-term information and i did struggle quite a bit with depression and when michael rutherford started bringing up uh or when kevin started bringing up doctors of uh, like uh dominic diagostino on the show talking about them and their research with uh, ptsd and traumatic brain injury with the military i decided to give it a try and i didn't think i was going to lose weight but that was a really nice side effect 
Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things when you just do what's right for your body, the weight just happens to come along with it. As it's, yeah. it's, that's just a normal part of being healthy is trying to maintain or get to or reach a more healthy, uh, normal weight. And so if you do the right things, it's going to get you there. Yeah. And it, you know, as you talk about quite a bit, as your dad talks about quite a bit, when you're doing keto, it's not just about your macros, but that nutrient density of the food and the quality of the food plays a huge role on it, as well as other factors like stress and sleep um, also are, are massive factors in, in how you live your healthy lifestyle. So I want to talk to you and how you got started uh, into your health studies and your, your nutrition and your health coaching. Where did that all begin for you? Yeah, so I mean, for I've always been into just health and wellness. I grew up as an athlete. I was on a traveling soccer team in middle school. I was on a high school wrestling team. I went to nationals for club. Um, did weightlifting. So I'm always very involved in just athletics, which just naturally comes with an, with a uh, interest in wellness and nutrition, especially with both weightlifting and wrestling being weight class restricted um, in high school. You're, you're, you know, it's by specific weight class. So there's a lot of weight loss and focus on weight, not necessarily in the best of ways. I did all that, you know, all of the worst possible things you could probably do sitting in saunas, you know, starving myself. I was fasting, but in a really unhealthy way that you shouldn't be doing at 16 years old. Uh, right. <laughs> so, right. Uh, you know, just, yeah. So just always involved in that. Um, but I also had a lot of digestive issues growing up, literally from the time I was eight, seven, eight, nine years old, really bad digestion, just in pain, you know, in tears in the bathroom as a kid. Um, and that really followed that never went away. Um, because of the extreme amount of trying to lose weight while I was a teenager and growing, um, you know, resulted in a lot of injuries as well. I sprained both my ankles multiple times. I dislocated both my clavicles and my shoulder, um, had hip problems, knee problems. And those. And then I went into, as an adult, went into the restaurant industry, uh, spent 14 years in the restaurant industry, hard floors, long days, crappy food lots of caffeine uh, yeah. <laughs> and the digestive issues didn't get better downing ibuprofen just to get through the day i was up to at 1.2 thousand milligrams of ibuprofen a day almost every day and, and that ibuprofen can have some gnarly effects on your digestive system as well and yeah i've been reading studies where they're actually finding um like a fibrous spider web like material in people's gut because of the ibuprofen and a lot of people are actually turning away from ibuprofen for things like cbd and uh kratom yeah and kratom kratom, is amazing yeah. yeah so it's uh yeah more research i've been doing on a lot of the over-the-counter stuff i'm kind of wondering whether or not it should be over-the-counter yeah the it'll it's they actually tried to um, restrict Kratom and it got, there was a huge petition up against it because so many people have had amazing success with it. So it's, it's held off for now, but we'll see. I won't be surprised if Kratom becomes a, a, a banned substance or restricted substance. Now, does Kratom have any kind of side effects that people need to worry about? Yes. So it does work similarly to opioids. So there is some concern um, with substance abuse and addiction, um, definitely less than, than opioids from what I have seen. Um, I would definitely restrict it in anyone under 18 as possible. Um, I would definitely go with a CBD instead of Kratom in, in under 18. Um, but Kevin actually had a pretty bad pinched nerve, uh, really bad actually, uh, end of last year. It's kind of towards the end of 2019. Uh, he and ended up going into the ER. It was so bad. They had him on a re muscle relaxer and opioid for the first day. And this is a man who he will sit through pain if possible, but it was that bad. He said, just gave it to me. And he was on both of them for two days, went home, got the Kratom and was off both of them within a day. The Kratom replaced both of them. Um, wow. And he was on that for probably a week or two and was able to stop it. Um, there's 
you know, as if you've ever looked into some of the research on addiction, there's definitely a lot of psychological aspects to that. Um, so when you're psychologically healthy and you have healthy relationships, addiction is less powerful. Um, so I think there's definitely a multifactorial play in there, but there is some concern with it for sure. Uh, addictions, are, I think, is also a great segue to go into my next question. Um, many people who are afraid to jump onto a healthy lifestyle, it's because they're addicted to the things that they used to do, the things that they used to eat. And this show is actually going to be part of our series, as I told you off the air, of getting started. So it, you've brought up a great question. When you're addicted to the previous things that you used to do, whether it's food, sleep patterns, whatever, how do you get that mindset to break away from those old habits and, and move on? Like what's, what's a good way for people to start like, and to, to change their way they think? So the, the biggest thing that I have seen, I have read, studied, learned, listened, practiced myself and, and, and helped others with is understanding the real core of your goals, right? Your why, right? Everyone wants to talk about your why. And what happens is people don't have a very deep why. They stop really shallow at the surface. So they want to lose weight, right? So they say, well, I want to lose 20 pounds. Cool. Why do you want to lose 20 pounds? Is it because your joints hurt and you want to feel better and losing weight will help with that? Is it because you're concerned about the you know diseases and, and, and things related with obesity and heart disease and diabetes and things like that? Is it because you want to be able to play with your kids or your grandkids? Like, what is it that is going to, is it because you just want to look good? Like, I don't care what it is, but we need to figure out why it is. Because what happens if you say, I just want to lose weight, right? Or maybe, maybe you even set a certain weight you want to have. When you reach that, your mind stops because you've reached your goal. This is a goal that you can do and stop when it's done. That's it. it it's, it's simple. I want to lose weight. Cool. You lost three pounds. Guess what? Your mind, psychologically, your mind is done. If all you say is, I want to lose weight, as soon as the scale changes, you've reached your goal. You lost weight. So you didn't even set the amount. But even if you set the amount, oh, I want to lose 20 pounds. Well, do you want to keep it off? Because if you lost it, you've reached your goal. Whether you gain it back or not doesn't matter. And that's what we have to understand. We have to speak to our subconscious, not just the conscious part of our brain. So if we understand that we want to lose weight to avoid long-term complications of obesity, if we want to lose weight to avoid the joint pain, well, that means you have to keep the weight off. So you have to continue, continuously be active in that. And you have to have a deeper understanding of why you want to stay like that. For me, I, I definitely don't want to have, you know, I've got a lot of family history. It doesn't matter how shallow or deep you go into my family tree. There's heart disease, there's diabetes, there's, you know, my grandfather had ALS and severe autoimmune disease. Um, there's all sorts of long-term chronic problems in every part of my tree. I really don't want that. Um, I would really definitely rather not go down that route. Uh, I've got kids that I fully enjoy. I was very thankful to have a dad who was, very active, literally physically, in my upbringing. I was very active in sports. He was my soccer coach. He was my wrestling coach. We'd get up, you know, at seven o'clock in the morning. My middle school started at nine. That was a horrible schedule. But we'd get up at six thirty, seven o'clock, and we'd go to the soccer field and we'd play something. We'd go for a bike ride in the morning, whatever it was. He would get us up and and keep us active. I want to be able to do that with my kids. I want to be able to be 50 years old. And if I have grandkids play with them, it, it saddens me every time I look at, you know, a grandparent who's 50 or 60 years old and can't play with their grandkids. Like you're 50, you should not be, you know, bending over how barely able to keep up with a five-year-old. Like you should still be able to be active. That's not a normal human thing. It's become common, but it's not normal. That is not something I can do for a year I can't, you know, work out for a year or eat well for a year and, and reach my goal. Like that is a goal for something when I'm 50, 60, 70 years old. I can't just stop, right? So it's understanding what, it, setting a goal that's actually going to keep you focused and keep you there. 
saying, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Cool. You lost the 10 pounds and you're done. You're going to go back to the habits that got you those 10 pounds in the first place. And they're going to come back. And going up and down in weight constantly can actually create more health issues than being a stable weight loss or maintaining a stable weight. Isn't that true? Yeah. The, the, the damage that that yo-yo dieting, right? This gain 20 pounds, lose 20, gain 30, lose 30, lose 40, whatever this up and down, it's just horrendous on your body. You just, it wants, it thrives in stability, what we call homeostasis, which is just this static norm. That's what your body thrives for. And we want to keep that, which means we need to keep a rather consistent lifestyle of, you know, it is the entire lifestyle. That's not just what you eat. It's your sleep, your stress, your your engagements with other people. It's what you eat. It's all these things. And it needs to be, it doesn't need to be perfect, right? We don't have to have this static structure routine that we just stick to this, but there needs to be some consistency over time. Yeah. And the population that you primarily work with through Destination Health and Let's Truck is the trucking population. It's something that I was a part of. And generally, if we want to call in a stereotype that may or may not be true, truckers can be very stubborn in, in their opinions and uh, very, uh, let's say, pigheaded about certain things. And it can be an extra challenge to get them started. And in this uh, industry, we have an extremely high mortality rate, uh, a lot of health issues. Drivers are constantly getting restricted DOT licenses. And for those listeners who, who don't understand, the DOT Department of Transportation makes truckers get a physical every so many years, given amount of time. It, it's usually about two years. However, if you have bad health markers, you can get restricted. Uh, DOT physical market uh, physicals where you have to go in more. One of the drivers that was a friend of mine actually had to go in every three months for a DOT physical. And that impedes your ability to work. It impedes your ability to function, to think, uh, because as a driver, you need to think on the fly. Now, you have chosen to work in this population with these people that often live up to that stereotype. What is the biggest challenges you have faced on getting people to see what they are doing is causing them more problems than good and getting to change their habits? So I think this is where if anyone else tried to come into this industry, any if I had come as myself generally, um, it would never work. And it's because, I mean, you've been overweight, right? Like, you know, you've tried. It's not like you just got there and you weren't trying. Most people who are overweight and obese, unhealthy, have tried to fix it. But 90% of conventional wisdom and advice on it doesn't work. It's short term. It doesn't last. It's not sustainable. So most of these people have tried, right? And so they're tired of being told what to do. or they're like, listen, you don't get our lifestyle. The hours are crazy. The stress is high. You can't move. You're stuck. You can't tell them to eat less and move more. They can't move more. That literally will cost them thousands and thousands of dollars to stop the truck every hour and move or to you know, take these long breaks. So it's this lack of understanding, and they feel like you just don't understand me. The difference was, is we did have my dad who came into this. My dad's been in the industry since before I was born, over 30 years. He's a third generation driver, um, multiple drivers in his family. He's grown up in this industry. He's been heavily involved going to all of the big truck shows. All of He's written in every magazine. He's been on satellite radio for over a decade. He's involved in this industry and his name is well known. He's a trusted person. Not only that, but time and time again, since the 90s, he's been ahead of the curve on many things. You know, oh, you need to slow down to make more money. No, I just need to go faster, right? Like, I just need to drive faster, do more miles, get more routes, and I'll make more money. But at the end of the day, your fuel cost is such a huge piece of, of your business cost that if you have slowed down and you improve your gas mileage, you'll make more money. 
in the nineties, no, everyone was like, Oh, that's hogwash. Now it's the norm. Right. And he's been ahead of that on just everything over and over and over. And so there, in the beginning, there's when he started talking about this on the radio show, there's a lot of pushback. I mean, he got some really, really angry, threatening messages um, about people who just didn't want to hear this. But there was the handful. It's amazing who, what happens when you challenge dogma. Yeah, there is. A, <laughs> there was a handful of people who trusted. It's like you know what? He's been right. I need this. Trusted it and took the advice. And within a couple months, we we're getting calls in left and right. I took your advice. I can't believe that you. And the more that happened, the more people called in with success, the more people started listening. We still get people four or five years later who are like, I have ignored you for years. And I finally took it. I'm so mad at myself for taking so long to finally listen. Those calls still come in. People who've been listening this whole time and are finally taking it because they can't. They're like that many people have called in. We have thousands. We have 23,000 plus in our Facebook group members now. Um, 80 percent plus who are truckers the others are family and friends and things like that the majority of them are truckers and the majority of those have had amazing successes I meaning the thousands and thousands of pounds we've seen lost the hundreds of medications we've seen no longer needed um, you can't refute that like we're not paying people to do this <laughs> right <laughs> like we're we're not paying people to fake this this is all organic that they've just done and listened to so you guys have not only focused on the physical health, but you've put a component in there that the physical health is related to your financial health as well. Yeah. And, and that's pretty amazing because when you look at whole health, one of the things that people do not include and do not think about, you know, they, they, they may think about their physique, their, their fitness levels, their nutrition, People think a little less about their mental health, their emotional health, and very few people seem to associate financial health in with their total health. But as we know, financial health can have a huge impact on your physical health through several factors. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. I mean, let's just talk about if you don't feel well, if you're unhealthy, your immune system is down. How many more sick days do you have to take? How much time off do you have to take? How much do you have to start digging into those other days? Do you get sick time? Like, do you only get, you know, five days and you're needing 10 to, you know, 15 a year because you're constantly getting sick? Like, that's time missed, right? So we're losing out on that. You're less productive. You're not going to reach those goals. Your mind isn't as clear. So you just don't, you're just not as productive. You're in an office job. And you need to crunch numbers and you need to do this or work on a project. And you're just not as mentally focused. You're not going to be as productive. You're not going to get those raises you want, right? So even the, the, the now and the long term of moving up with drivers, I mean, they just, every time they're not in that seat, they're losing money. If they have to go to a DOT physical, you know, every three months or every six months instead of every two years, that's time off they have to take to go do that. That's money lost. So it is a direct impact of that. And, you know, it's like you said, a lot of us don't realize that our physical health has an impact on our financial health on multiple different levels. The better we feel, the more productive we can be, the less time off we need. And that directly puts money back in your pocket so that, oh, well, it's too expensive. I can't afford it. You can't afford not to be. Just think of if you can be, I mean, the my favorite thing about this is mental clarity. It's my absolute favorite because so much of what I do is content creation, is studying, is learning. It's very mentally draining. I know days that I, if I went out and I had some, you know, I went out and just didn't care and I ate a burger with a bun and, you know, had a beer at, at, at a pub and just, you know, went all out and didn't care. Man, it is several days that I can feel that mental fogginess of what that does to my body. And that's for me. Maybe for some people it doesn't, but I know for me, I I know what mental clarity feels like. That's where I spend most of my time. Most of my life, I didn't know what mental clarity felt like until I actually got all of that junk out. And the difference of, you know, if I'm in a mentally demanding job to be able to have that kind of focus and narrow down and, and just drill that stuff out, that's huge. That's why you look at the, you know, if you go to Silicon Valley, and you see how common biohacking and 
the keto diet and intermittent fasting, extended fasting, all these things are, it's becoming incredibly common and probably most common in that industry because they know how imperative it is to just nail, just completely focus on a project and get it done. So it's, I mean, it's crazy how much that can turn. You can't, you don't know your potential in money, right? Like that's expansive. Your potential for raises and uh, promotions and job offers, especially in those kind of jobs are, are endless and what that can do if you can perform better. Yeah. And, you know, it does seem like a lot of our, our current understanding of things like cholesterol that has been changing from our previous understanding of the heart health theory and things. A lot of these new innovations are actually not coming from doctors, but coming from engineers and, and programmers and stuff from, from computer backgrounds who have learned how to break things down and look at whole systems and how they function. You know, people like uh, Ivor Cummings is really good at uh, Dave Feldman with the, with the research on the cholesterol. So it is very interesting how a lot of our new understanding will, relates to our previous understanding before Ansel Keys, but how it's coming from that industry and being driven from that industry and then doctors are starting to fall on board after the the computer engineers and things have made these discoveries through self-research and citizen science. Uh, so without pulling, you know, showing how you pull the rabbit out of the hat, what are some of the things that you guys do through Destination Health or the programs that you run? Get people initiated into healthy lifestyles. How, how do you go about that? First thing we say is the number one thing. Well, we do a lot of different things, but just eat real food. I don't care what that even looks. Most people are not eating the majority of their food from real food. 80% of the grocery store is in the center, right? Is not real food. It's packaged, processed, shelf-stable junk. And it's not what your body knows. The number one thing anyone can do, and it, just to get started, is just start eating real food. Anything on that outside perimeter. And they're basically the refrigerated areas, right? Go to the produce section. I don't even, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's fruits, vegetables, roots, greens, berries. I don't care. Go to the produce section and start eating there. Go to the butcher and start eating meats and eggs and cheeses and, and dairies if you need it. Like, just start eating those kinds of things. I don't even care if that even includes dried beans and, and some gluten-free grains and things like that. Even that, like, even having those things, rice and beans, is an incredibly easy way to make a, an affordable diet. People who are like, I just can't afford to eat meat and vegetables. It's too expensive. Cool. Subsidize it with rice and beans. Get dry rice and beans. It's stupid cheap. A five-pound bag of beans costs, what, three bucks? Like, it's not much. And that is, the, the dried beans makes a ton of meals, right? If you were to get beans and you were to soak them overnight, it takes no effort. You literally just put them in some water overnight on the counter. Really easy to do. That's not a ton of effort. Rinse them in the morning and put them in a slow cooker to let them cook all day. Very little effort. And it's going to get rid of a lot of the problems with it. And if you make it in bulk and then you cool it, well, guess what? You actually reduced, it's the big problem with with legumes, for example, once you properly prepare them, they're still going to be moderately high in carbohydrates. Well, by cooling them, and then now you've created what's called resistant starch, which basically takes that starch, that high carbohydrate content, and actually turned it into more of a fiber-like compound that is good for your gut. And you know, all these probiotics that we talk about, it feeds those instead of being instead of spiking your blood sugar and causing insulin and weight issues. So now we've made it a better product and it's really cheap. Is it ideal for everyone? No, but is it far better than eating Cheetos and chips and pasta? Hell yes. Like that is going to be far better and it is very affordable. Same with you know getting some white jasmine rice. There's not a whole lot of problems with it. It's just it's just pure starch. At that point, it's not ideal, but you know, as long as we're not doing giant piles of it, we're just adding it into subsidized some of your some of your foods. Potatoes, 
something super cheap, right? Many of these starches, potatoes, rice, and beans. If you subsidized your meals with this, you're eating real whole foods still. We're, we're, gluten, we're still gluten-free, so we've got some, but we're not having the major inflammatory parts of grains, right? So we've at least gluten-free with rice. We've got the legumes. We've got some potatoes, really cheap starches. It's going to help add volume to your plate at a very low cost. Eggs. Eggs are even the most expensive eggs, the six, seven dollars a pound. When you break that down, even if you ate four eggs, right, which four large eggs, plenty of protein, you're getting about 25 grams of protein, tons of healthy fat. The nutrition is amazing. And it's what, even at $7 a pound, which you, pay, you might pay at the farmer's market for the top end eggs, that's less than $2 a serving of protein. So even at the really high end, if you just go and got the decent ones for three or four bucks, right? They found some neighbors that are charging four or five dollars per per that's a dollar twenty-five for a portion of protein. That is incredibly cheap. So even the re, we, you know, we've we're used to paying two dollars for eggs, so six sounds crazy. But when you realize how cheap that is per portion, that's still a great portion. It's really affordable protein. Yeah, uh, and what I love about you guys is even though you guys are big proponents on the keto diet. You guys uh, at Destination Health, you and your dad, Ken Cochran, you guys are not dogmatic about your approach, and you guys are about making the better choice when you can't make the best choice. You know, so the like you said, not going for the Cheetos, but going for something that at least is going to be more nutritious and easier for your body to handle. And you guys do a lot of targeted dieting practice uh, toward different thing, issues that people have and helping people formulate a diet that's help, that's best for them. And your dad regularly talks about the most nutritious foods like oysters, but if you're allergic to oysters, now that's toxic to you, so you can't eat it, so you have to uh, choose the foods that are best for you. So when you're formulating working with somebody, you're working obviously within their financial or um, other constraints they may have. They may be in a food desert. Uh, I've driven all across this country and I can tell you that uh, what's available in certain areas is definitely not available in other areas. So you may have restrictions just based on where you live as, as well as the finances. So when you're working with somebody, how do you, how do you get, um, uh, that targeted nutrition, how do you figure out what they need and and what um, and build that 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 diet that works for them, even though it may not be with the conventional dogma of even in the keto or carnivore world or anything like that? Yeah, so first I want to say is, you know, we talk food being in a food desert really doesn't even matter anymore. Now, financial will always have an aspect, right? You can only afford what you can afford. Sourcing is no longer an issue. Wonderful thing about the internet and really quick shipping, right? So if you live, at least if you were in the lower 48 of the US, you can get the highest quality meat shipped right to your door. You can get the highest quality seafood shipped right to your door, all frozen. You can get produce shipped to your door weekly. There are multiple things that you can now get shipped to your door, fresh food, right? So. As long as you, as long as you were at an address that can receive food, can receive packages, you can get mail, right? You can get those things. So sourcing no longer is an issue. That's one of the amazing things that has come out in the last five years, really, because just five years ago when I started this, there was no company, major company, shipping high quality meat to all the states. They were very local, was small farm shipping to their area, maybe within their state or maybe their region. Now we have multiple companies shipping all to all 48 states and even to all 50, some of them. You've got you know produce companies shipping to all 40, at least all 48 states. It's pretty amazing what is available now. So the availability is no longer an issue. Now, you're paying for convenience, right? So it is more expensive. So it could still be a financial issue. Um, as far as figuring out individuals' diets, so we, you know, we use different tools to look at an individual. It's not just like, oh, well, you know, I've got high blood pressure and I'm overweight. Like we use tools, we use something called the Nutritional Assessment Questionnaire. This is a 
300 plus question uh, assessment. It's not a test, it's not a quiz, it's not a right or wrong. And it's really just on a scale of zero to three. Zero being, I never have this symptom. Three being, it's every freaking day, right? Like I deal, yes, that is something I deal with every day. And based on, it's broken down into systems and areas of the body. So utilizing this, we can start to see where your body's actually struggling where you are struggling as an individual, not like you have hypertension, so it must be this, right? It's like, let's understand where your body is from a foundational standpoint, struggling. What are the foundations of, of, your, of your problem? Not just, what, not just what that root problem has ended up as a systemic issue and how it's showing up as a symptom, but with this, these collections of symptoms, we can start to see commonalities, right? So it's like, oh, it's, you know, you don't just have bloating, but you have, you also burp, you know, shortly after you're not hungry, you know, supplements on an empty stomach bother you, you have all these different things It starts to point towards this problem or, you know, these different things point towards this problem. So we can start to see this collection and come together. And that really starts to help us pinpoint exactly where the problem might be lying from. Then we can also just look at lab work. We can, labs are phenomenal. One of the problems in the current medicine world is that labs are looked at horribly. They're, they're looked at in, in for two different reasons. They're looked at for disease determination, right? So they're only, but you don't wake up one day with like a heart disease. There was a progression that got there, right? You don't wake up one day, you know, with just any disease. Like you don't just wake up from a chronic disease. There was a progression that got there. And our, the lab ranges on for, for blood labs and different labs are set to only monitor disease state. So, I mean, the range could be, uh, whatever it is, could be from 90 to 150. But if you're at 149, they're going to tell you you're A-OK. Well, no, I'm 99% I'm towards disease. Because if I go too high your point, then I'm 151. Oh, we got to put you on medication. Well, why didn't you give me a warning when I was at 149 and working my way there? The year before, I was at 140. I'm at 149. Why didn't you tell me about the progression? But most doctors literally just go down the go down the results and look for highs and lows. And if you're out of the range, then they tell you. And they're looking at them individually. They don't look at the relationship. Everything in the body is, you know, we, you kind of referred to it earlier with the engineers looking at things, that everything works together, right? It's not all individualized. We have every part of our body and health compartmentalized. You go to a nephrologist for your kidneys. You go to an endocrinologist for your endocrine system for your diabetes. You go to a psychologist for your mental health. You go to a gastroenterologist for your, for your digestion. Well, guess what? All of those may have been because of food sensitivities causing inflammation, systemic issues. So one part, but none of those doctors are communicating with each other. We look at labs the same way. We're not seeing the relationship between them. We're not seeing the progression. So this thing called functional medicine or integrative medicine that we look at, that's what we're looking at. For me, I'm not trying to diagnose or treat or cure anything. What I'm looking for is imbalances. I'm looking for nutritional issues. So I look at labs on a completely different basis for completely different reasons. I'm looking at different ranges and for different things and for different and the relationships of things. And so even the most standard labs that doctors run I can look at for a lot of nutritional imbalances because everything in the body is driven by nutrition, whether that's macronutrients or micronutrients. Everything in the body happens from a reaction. It has to come from somewhere, right? The very basis of science, you cannot create something from nothing, right? So anything that happens in the body had to come from something. Everything we get from our body comes from three things. We eat it, we drink it, or we breathe it. So it has to come from those three things. The majority of it is we eat it, right? So it has to come from those vitamins, those minerals, those proteins, fats, carbohydrates. So if something is wrong in the body, we can look at, well, is that because we're deficient in that? You know, are we deficient? If this enzyme, the liver enzyme, for example, it's very, it's nutrient dependent on certain nutrients. So if it's low, well, it's very likely because we don't have the nutrients to make it. If it's really, if it's starting to go high, well, it's probably because the liver is having to pump out tons of it because it's a problem. So we can start to see these things and address that through diet and lifestyle to help those systems. And that's what we do. We're, we're looking at an individual. We don't take 
like, oh, you have this problem, so you get this thing. It's like, let's look at you where you're struggling as an individual and start targeting your problems, not your diagnosis. I want to look at you, not your diagnosis. That's awesome. Now, I, I have chosen to be on the keto path because I find that works very well for me, and I try to get as much nutrient density. I, I, a few years ago, I began incorporating organ meats, mainly liver, into my diet, things like that. Uh, but there's all these different methods of, of lifestyle choices that people make when it comes to food that they become very tunnel visioned on. And, and if somebody challenges that, that uh, perception of what they believe is healthy, even if it isn't working as well as they think it is, uh, people kind of jump on to this, this, bandwagon for whatever they're going to go whether it's vegan vegetarian keto carnivore which is fairly new it's working well for many people but some people may not carry uh my my partner in all this she she tried carnivore and it does not seem to work as well for her as it does other people and many people view their dietary choices as possibly the panacea for all their problems but it's not sometimes it's not that so how do you go about convincing somebody that their the choices that they've made may not actually be the the choices that were the best for them it's really simple when someone wants to when they're when they're really fighting it i ask them how's it working for them because if you came to me, it's not because you're fantastic and you're feeling you're feeling wonderful. You came to me because something's not working, right? So oftentimes it works until it doesn't, right? So let's take the example of veganism, a diet I really just don't agree with long term. I think it could have some short term implications for some people. Long term, it just doesn't make sense from an evolutionary standpoint of humans. There's never been a vegan society long-term in like in the wild right as a indigenous culture um, we've always needed animal products to su in some degree uh, which just makes sense physiologically to understand the needs of the body and what is not available in plants but if you go from the standard american diet of highly processed foods and you go to a whole food vegan diet you know what the key there was is that you went from processed foods to whole foods. You are going to feel better. I don't care if it's vegan. You are going to feel better, at least for a short time. And so what happens is people connect to that. They felt better going to that. So every problem moving forward cannot be the dietary change. They can't understand that some things take time to set in. Nutrient deficiencies don't happen in a day, right? It's not like, oh, well, you didn't eat this thing for weeks, so now all of the symptoms come up. It can take B12 deficiency, can take up to five years. We think that B12 is a daily thing because it's a water-soluble nutrient. So most people think that water-soluble nutrients you have to get every single day. The fat-soluble nutrients your body can store because you can store lots of fat. And so we can store those nutrients in the fat. Well, what we found is the liver can actually store up to about five years worth of B12. So vegans can, that's why vegans can feel great for years. We have there some of the top, most popular vegans in YouTube and these social media and forums and blogs around years seven to anywhere from five to 10 years are really starting to come out and be like, I can't do it anymore. I've, I've gotten these, these horrific symptoms. And we've got men who literally can't have an orgasm anymore. They've been vegan for so long. It's, it's become that bad. They're so deficient in zinc, iron, and B12. Their body literally can't even do it anymore. Like they're, they've gotten erectile dysfunction so bad. Like, and they're 35 years old. That shouldn't be happening. But it's because they've become so deficient and they felt good for so long. And they finally caved in, ate a piece of meat. And they were like, oh my God, we have people going from vegan to carnivore. I mean, it's crazy going from one, and I don't necessarily think that we should go to do either of the extremes long term, but it's this, this realization, but people get so stuck in that, well, it worked for me then, 
So it can't be the problem. It has to be something else. But many of these things can take time to set in. It, there could have totally been benefits from it. Going from a processed food diet to a whole food diet of any kind is going to make you feel better. Processed food is not good for your body. Yeah, a little inside baseball. I was a 500-pound vegetarian, over 500-pound vegetarian. And I lost, a, I lost a bit of weight going vegetarian, but I didn't feel well. I did, you know, I did the low calorie. I did all that general things that people tell you is going to be healthy. You know, the the documentary that uh, that they just put out that hit Netflix. Uh, what was it called about about veganism? And it's supposedly the healthiest thing. Um, I keep There's so many. It was. There's one yeah. that comes out every few months. It feels like on there. This, this one was done by James Cameron, and he brought in all these vegan athletes and, and yeah but i tried uh, that, oh that game changers game changers that, yeah, yeah. I, I i tried that years and years ago i was a power lifter I, i'm six foot six I'm, I'm not a little guy and even when i was 600 pounds i carried my weight fairly well um so i i built structurally as a big guy and what i found is that when i tried to go vegetarian vegan it impacted me fast in a bad way I mean, like, I didn't last five years being, you know, oh, yeah, I feel great. It was, like, literally, like, two, three months, like, I'm passing out in the gym, you know? And yeah, that's pro I, that, is, that is massive protein deficiency. The amount of protein your body needs at that size yeah. at 6'6 six, six is going to be high. You can't get – I mean, you, you would need to eat a half a container of vegan protein powder a day to even get close. Oh, I, I, I couldn't eat enough throughout the day. I have been kicked out of a few all-you-can-eat places because I would just go clear the place. And uh, I, I, when I was vegetarian and vegan, like I, I was hangry right after I ate my meal. <laughs> and I just couldn't eat enough. Now that I've, I've done the keto thing and I actually stay on a lot of animal proteins, and I eat very high carnivore, uh, cycling in carnivore veggies and things like that. But I have periods of time where I eat pretty, pretty much carnivore, and I feel much better. And my my brain function, as long as I keep the fats up, and I, I'm a butter chugger. I do the the bulletproof coffees and the and, the, and you know we call them fatty joes, which is the name of the show. I, my brain works better, and the so these are the things that I found for myself just through trial and error and also learning from, from you guys. And it may not be the conventional things because I don't exactly fit in all the time with the carnivores and I don't exactly fit in all the time with the ketos and I don't, but I'm doing what's right for me. And predominantly keto, I, I do stay, I do stay in uh, the keto diet as much as possible. Now, you're not only trained in health, but you're trained as a chef. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that people always have a hard time getting started, and this is some, the reason why Carrie does what she does, I, I've joined her to do that, is we actually teach people to cook. And we teach people how to make healthy meals and even make some of the things that were like the favorite stuff that they had before yes. so that their diet lifestyle can be sustainable and they can still have some of the things that they love so how do you go about getting people to cook for themselves and make their own food so they can control ingredients and stay satisfied with what they eat sustainable on their lifestyle most people will probably be surprised about what i say my number one suggestion is stop looking at cookbooks number one suggestion is to stop looking at cook because what happens Cookbooks are designed to be really pretty, to look fancy and elaborate. They are meant, most recipes in a cookbook are meant for dinner parties, are meant for special occasions. They are even the everyday. Are you kidding me? They're 10 plus ingredients, especially in the truck. No, one that thinking, you've been in a truck. You can't carry all that around. I don't even want to keep it all in my kitchen. You know how many times I've gone to make a recipe and I buy something and then that spice or whatever sits in my in my kitchen for two years before I use it again? No one wants oh, yeah. to cook that way. So I go total opposite. Like let's let's back up. Let's make this really simple. This 90% of my meals are some kind of vegetable and a piece of meat. 
and tons of herbs and spices. I use herbs and spices all the time, constantly. That's how I change my flavor. I can take cauliflower rice and ground beef and make four different dishes. They're completely different, right? Different ethnicities, different cultural foods, just from those two things. I mean, how many different cultures have have a like a fried rice or some kind of rice and, and a meat? I mean, that's super common, right? So you fried chickens do, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so you can you can do these kind of things just by changing a sauce or a, some spices and seasoning combinations, and, and just start there. I mean, keep it simple, make it, re- and then it only takes ten to fifteen minutes to make. That's the other problem. Most recipes, they're like, well, this is gonna, you know, two hours later. And, you know, a giant pile of dishes and three pans, you're done. And now you got to take all that time to clean. Or you just literally don't have that in a kitchen. So your first component, you know, in the truck, your first component is cold by the time you finish your other one because you had to use the same pot and rinse it out in between. And so now just everything is cold. One's cold, one's warm, one's hot. Like, it doesn't work. So it's these just really simple. Just understand component cooking. Have a vegetable, a meat put saute the vegetables, throw the meat in, add some spices and herbs or a sauce, and be done with it. Keep it really simple. At the time, at the time, it's the, I don't even cook my vegetables. It's a, I cook a piece of meat and have an avocado with it. Like that's literally probably like half my lunches. It's a piece of meat and some avocado. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I did a lot of cooking in my truck and that's actually how, how I hear where I'm at right now with Carrie. Um, and I would post a lot of the things that I cooked in the truck and I actually got occasionally blowback by other drivers. Well, you must not be driving if you're preparing food that looks like that. But I was, and I just learned tricks. I, I, I grew up camping. So I learned how to do, you know, rudimentary stuff and throw things together. I would get metal trays to go inside my slow cooker so I could cook separate things all at the same time, you know, and, nice. and yeah, you, just different things like that. Um, uh, so people often have this fear of, of cooking food for themselves. We, a lot of people don't know anymore like how to cook for themselves because they're so used to eating pre-prepared foods or ingredients that are put together. And it's, it's something that's really difficult to seem to introduce to somebody and how to cook for themselves. Carrie has actually taken to doing uh, basic videos on how to like zest a lemon. Yeah. How to get, because people don't know how to do this, how to cut a leak up, how to cut up, because people aren't being trained. And it seems to be very intimidating. So going that simple way that you're doing seems to take a lot of that intimidation away. And I mean, I've seen some of your food, you know, you're doing these seafood stews and things like that that you're putting up. And I've seen the blowback that you've got. Well, I can't make that on the truck or, you know, you know, that type of thing. So it's, but the thing is, is you may not be able to make that exact thing, but you can make delicious food yep. just by being a little creative, you know, using a little bit of, uh, uh, of intelligence and creativity to figure out what's going on. I, I turned my Instapot into a smoker. Nice. <laughs> so, you know, you can do things. You, you can. You can do things. But uh, we're getting close to the end of time, and uh, I have some questions. We have a Patreon group. It's at, uh, at Patreon at Carrie Brown, um, and we also have a website, CarrieBrown.com, and we have a group for our Patreons called the Rockstars. And the Rockstars get some privileges because they help us do the things that we do. They literally fund all the free content that puts that we put out uh, because they want to be a part of helping people. But as a, as a privilege for being funded, I've allowed some of my rock stars to ask a few questions. And so we're going to, we're going to pick about three questions because only really two rock stars at this round actually ask questions because you're the very first interview. So, I have from Debbie Jenkaitis, one of our rock stars. She would like to know his, your thoughts on carnivore and how to keep it interesting and not spicy. And not spicy. So literally spicy, like spicy. She does not like heat. Okay. She does not like heat. 
so not using heat. That's a, that's an interesting way to uh, concern of, of carnivore. I didn't know that was a thing. So I haven't done a lot of carnivore. I will tell you, I've tried carnivore. I get to about day two or three and I'm bored. I just, it's not that I'm bored. I just love vegetables. I really do. I love vegetables. I love avocados. I love condiments. Um, so a lot of those, like, I just mess. I'm like, eh. Um, but, I mean, change it up. So get different kinds of animals. Get, you know, get seafood. Use eggs. Use chicken, pork, beef. Get different cuts. Explore new things that you haven't tried before, new cuts and things like that. Definitely explore there. Um, me personally, yeah, again, you could go the super dogmatic, strict, you can only do it this way version of, of carnivore where you can literally only have something from an animal. Or you can be like, you know what, I'm going to have some herbs and spices because that's going to work for me and that's going to keep me interested in this. So add some herbs, herbs and spices, change it up with that, add some some flavor. Um, and and that's, that would be my way of, of trying to keep it that way. And again, the spices don't have to be spicy. It doesn't have to be super hot, right? But you're using cumin and coriander and, you know, and, you know it's, you'd be amazed what cinnamon can do on a meat. Um, so, you know, even some of those and lots of different herbs and just change it up, go with sweet herbs and go with, you know, with more savory herbs and try these different things. Um, and really just, just like we always want, go for a variety. So get as try all the different fish, try all the different shellfish, try the different eggs, try the different cuts of meat, try the different animals, um, and just keep moving around so that you're not having ground beef every day. You're like, this is boring. Ribeye. Yeah. Ribeye every day. Thing. Yeah. I love ribeye. I'm yeah. not eating one every yeah. day for months on end. So I have a question from our one of our other rock stars, Tina Moonheim. And she uh Asked, if someone is stuck, what areas do we look at as to getting us unstuck in their in their dietary? Oh, yeah. So stalls, uh, definitely lots of. There's lots of them. We could, you know, you could like you said, we read a whole book on this. Um, big areas to look at: check your sleep. You know, make sure we're getting good quality sleep. Check your stress levels. Make sure we're just getting movement. Movement's not really about calories. There's nothing to do with calories. It's everything to do with the hormonal response that we get from it. Exercise is one of the number one things we can do to increase our insulin sensitivity, which is what we want. We want nice insulin sensitive cells. Um, kind of a hack that you can do if you're just like, man, I really, I'm, I'm craving some carbs and you're trying to stay low carb. It, it, it has nothing to do again with the caloric aspect of it, but exercise, especially higher intensity exercises. So weight training or high intensity interval training creates this process called non-insulin dependent glucose uptake, meaning you can get glucose out of your blood and into your cells, which is what we want, without the use of insulin. So great, you wanna have that piece of fruit, you wanna have the sweet potato, go have a, go do a hard workout and then eat that. You're going to create, you're gonna have much less of the insulin issues that you would have than eating that large piece of, of carbohydrate. It's gonna be really beneficial with, you're going to enjoy that without having the insulin spike, right? Even if the glucose goes up, you're not actually using insulin to get that into the cell. Then now again, that could be like, oh, I worked out this morning and then I had a big thing at dinner. It needs to be relatively close within that short window right after. Um, but that can be a great way to enjoy those carbs and not have to worry about it so much with your insulin. Um, the timing of your macronutrients, definitely checking and making sure you're getting adequate protein, especially with women making sure we are getting adequate protein is huge. Um, most women are under eating protein, not overeating. I see very few people overeating protein, um, especially in the women category. So checking in with your protein, making sure you're not having too many carbs overall for your activity level and your insulin resistance. Um, but then seeing the timing of your, of your macronutrients, try having more protein earlier in the day and then your carbs later at night. Go really go high protein, moderate fat in the morning kind of balance fat and protein in the, in the middle of the day, maybe bring in some non-starchy carbs. Towards the end of the day, go moderate fat, moderate to high fat, lower protein, and, high, and that's where you might have your starch. That's where you might have your more carby meal if you're going to. And what that does is actually help improve your sleep on multiple different levels. It balances your blood sugar better throughout your sleep, 
so that you're not waking up from blood sugar dips and cortisol spikes, but it's also improving your serotonin to melatonin production because it, it allows tryptophan to get into the brain at a better efficiency. And this is going to then, tryptophan is an amino acid that goes into, you know, we, we talk about turkey, right? Making it sleepy because it's rich in, in tryptophan. Um, but it's really actually the potatoes and the starch that's helping it get there. Uh, and so it, we get that tryptophan into the brain and then we create the right neurotransmitters and hormones we need for healthy sleep. But high protein blocks that because the other amino acids are going to compete with it. So we want lower protein in the evening, higher carb. The other problem with protein at night is that it ramps up your metabolism, which is going to keep you awake. So protein does that the most out of any of the macronutrients. So you don't want to eat super late at night, right? Making sure you're not eating an hour or right before bed. Um, you're, you're going to be, you're just going to get poor sleep and poor sleep ruins your insulin sensitivity. It's a huge, poor sleep is a huge factor. Of, again, why truck drivers, third shifters, um, any of those kind of industries have tons and tons of problems with their health because of the, the effect that has. So checking in with those things can be huge. Um, the big hormonal one that everyone likes to talk about with weight is the thyroid because the thyroid is what drives your metabolism. So having a doctor who will order the right labs and know how to order that and know how to interpret those is huge. Most doctors do not, they're running on 50 year old data for thyroid. Um, they're not taught to look at deeper. So making sure your doctor is running a TSH, a free T4, a free T3, reverse T3, and then TPO and TG antibodies for the thyroid. That is a full complete thyroid panel. And that's what they need to be looking at to really understand what is going on with the thyroid and that can be huge so much so that back in the 90s weight loss clinics were actually using thyroid hormone to induce weight loss and it's still super common in bodybuilders to cut for competition to use thyroid hormone because it works that quickly it got shut down in the 90s because people were dying because people who weren't hypothyroid were given thyroid hormones and becoming hyperthyroid which can put you into cardiac arrest because it controls your heart rate not things we want to do, and you shouldn't be taking it if you don't need it, but it's that powerful at ramping your metabolism up. So if it's not working properly, you have a very slow metabolism. I'm going to throw one more rock star question to go in de detail before we hit the rapid fire one, because I think it's an important question because many people are, are experimenting with this now. But back to Debbie Jenkaitis. She says, what, she asks, what are the supplements needed in doing extended fasting versus intermittent fasting or no fasting on keto at all? So number one thing, and this is whether, whether it's a day, three days, five days, minerals, those electrolytes, get those in. Um, at, at the very least, do a pinch of salt in every, in every bit of water that you have. Every glass of water that you have, do a pinch of sea salt or pink Himalayan salt red mint salt, real salt, whatever it is, get at least that in, if not additional electrolytes. Uh, we love our, the product we sell for, uh, for um, electrolytes, which is light balance. Um, it's just a, it's a, it's great because it's just a solution. It's a water solution. You just pour a capful, um, would be phenomenal. That's huge at minimum. Um, the problem with it is a lot of things are need proper digestive stimulation to absorb and break down the supplements. So when you're not eating anything, you may not digest those things very well. Um, so it can be dependent. Uh, I would say if you're going longer than five to seven days, if you're doing a really extended fast, you should be working with a practitioner who can help guide you that because now we do want to be mindful. That's also why so Dr. Jason Fung, who's kind of like the king and godfather of fasting, right? He talks about how um, you know, for if you have periods of fasting, you need to have really heavy periods of feasting. You need because all of those days you weren't eating, you weren't getting nutrients in. You need to make up some of those micronutrients. So when you are eating, it needs to be nutrient dense. You need to be if you are doing regular fasting, you should be taking a multivitamin. Not something I recommend for everyone, but if you're doing lots of regular longer fasts, you should be doing a multivitamin, a good, very high quality. Don't go to Walmart and get one. Get a practitioner sourced high quality multivitamin, but you probably should be on something because you're, unless you're eating oysters, clams, mussels, and organ meats at every meal, you're probably not getting enough nutrition in. 
Yeah. So we're going to hit into a rapid fire response. And I do add I, one rock star question to this. And then the rest, I've, I've pre-selected a, from a bank of questions that I have. So we just want to do real quick fired out answers and yeah. kind of move on. It's, it's fun. So uh, from Tina Moonheim, since working with truckers, what difficulties truckers need to overcome um, to stick with Tito? They need to overcome the thought that this is difficult in the truck. It's funny because when truckers, for, when they first start in their first month, they're like, ah, you guys know how difficult it is on the road, right? It's just this and that. Six months down the road, it's the opposite. This is so easy to do in the truck. It's when I go home and I'm around family and friends who aren't eating this way that I struggle. It's so easy because it's, you control everything that's in the truck. If it's not there, you don't want to stop. Stopping costs you money. So if it's not in the truck, you're not going to get it. All right. So my bank of questions, what are your stress relief activities? Uh, breathing exercises, deep breath into the belly exercises, and preferably doing it out in the sun. My favorite thing, lay out in the grass, in the sun, and do breathing exercises. What are your three biggest foods to avoid? Grains, processed industrial oils, and sugars. I call them my three you, public health enemies. Yeah. What, uh, there's a doctor recently that said uh, uh, the industrial oils is far worse than even smoking. Yep. So what is your biggest goal and what are the actions are you taking to get there? Uh, my biggest goal right now is to buy a house. Um, and so I am actively working to constantly bring more value to Destination Health as a company so that they can pay me more <laughs> so that I can get towards buying a house. What are your top five health heroes? Who? Dad. No, for sure. He's the one that got me into this. Definitely my dad. Um, Mark Sisson. Uh, Chris Kresser. Uh, man, yeah, I don't like, I don't put a lot of people in pedestals. I'll tell you that. I really don't. Um, some people I look up to, uh, recently I've been really liking Dr. Carrie Jones. She is the um, director over, um, at, uh, Dutch hormone testing. I really like that precision analytics. I really like her. She's just incredibly knowledgeable and all of that, just stuff I'm digging into. And I guess Michael McAvoy, who is the, um, director and owner over at metabolic healing which is the program i'm studying for uh functional medicine uh lab interpretation nice. so i've just been digging his stuff right now and what are your top five resources for people getting started let's truck.com learn.letstruck.com which is our university our youtube channel <laughs> chris Kresser's website and uh mark's daily apple awesome all right, so we're going to go ahead and close this up. We've been talking for quite a while now. And where can people find you and get in touch with you if they want to get a part of your programs and, um, and work with you? That was pretty cool. It was the first three. <laughs> so let's truck.com, L-E-T-S, and then truck.com. Um, alternatively, learn.letstruck.com is a, it's our university. You can see our courses over there. Um, I think our YouTube channel, our YouTube channel is actually honestly one of the easiest ways. If you go to YouTube and you search destination health, um, in every description of our videos has all of our links for anything you could want. So honestly, that's probably the easiest way to find everything. You can find it on our website. It just takes a bit more work. Um, the YouTube channel, honestly, is probably the easiest way because that description box just has all the links right there. Awesome. All right, everybody. So we're going to close out this show today. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And we'd love to have Michael back on at a later date, talk about some other things, because it's definitely a conversation I think I can keep going for quite a while. Yeah. All right, everybody have a great time and uh, make sure you all be nice to each other and put out some good vibes. You don't be, uh, be kind to people that you wouldn't normally be kind to. Thank you for joining us on the Fatty Joe Show. Be sure to leave a comment and subscribe. It helps the show reach more people. To support the show, as well as Carrie Brown and Yogi's work on the blog, Keto Recipe Development, Masterclasses, 
And to gain access to private Facebook groups and other awards, go to patreon.com slash the fatty Joe show or patreon.com slash Terry Brown. Also check out our Terry Brown and Yogi Parker YouTube channel for video versions of the fatty Joe show recipe videos and more. Join our awesome community on the Facebook group, the keto kitchen with Carrie Brown and Yogi Parker and check out our CarrieBrown.com website for recipes blog posts, discounts, cookbooks, masterclasses, and other great stuff. Thank you so much.